Sligo Jazzers, let's talk about something a little bit odd. Odd time signatures I'm talking about. So an odd time signature is any time signature that can't be divided by two or three. So the common time signatures like 4-4, 2-4, 3-4, 6-8, 8 those can all be divided by two or three. You can feel them in a grouping of two or three. And odd time signatures, the typical ones that jazz players like to use, would be 5-4-5-8-7-4-7-8-9-8-11-8-15-8. And today we're going to take a jazz workshop classic, jam session standard, Blue Bossa by Kenny Dorham. And Kenny Dorham wrote this beautiful melody in 4-4, four, four, and it sounded like this. One, two, one, two, three. take one beat off of the second of every second bar and play this tune in 7-4 just for variety and to challenge ourselves and to get a different perspective. So in order to do that let's think about a few different types of 7-4 subdivisions. You can think of the big seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or you could subdivide that with four and three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Or you could subdivide that with be, uh, two beats, two beats, and three beats. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Or if we're in seven, four, we can even subdivide with uh, groupings of seven eighth notes. So two bars of seven eight for every one bar of seven four and play this little clave. So there I'm thinking one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So all of those different ways of feeling the seven might come into play. Um, and what I encourage you to do at, at this point, we're going to play Blue Bossa in 7-4. You can snap along, you can clap along, you can sing along, you can play along. And uh, I'll see you on the other side. Okay, here we go. Blue Bossa, 7-4. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs>
This one is permutation number seven, and this uses the number system two one seven two. So, um, and same thing again. You go around the cycle of fourths, and you get it down cold. Get it under your fingers, and uh, just have fun with it, and just keep going. So, and same thing again, you can climb up or go down and then just keep going around. Now you can break up the rhythm as well. You can um, rhythmically do it in different kind of uh, styles, you know. from doing that permutation in a very simple way and then you can uh, start messing around with it okay so remember just to do it the, the simple way and then you can start breaking it down into little fragment uh, t time signatures you know So I always make my students do it this slow because once you do it that slow you can get it under your fingers a lot quicker and then you know when you feel more confident you can start breaking um, uh, breaking the time down. So here's a random improv of uh, everything that we've talked about. Um, I'll go through the numbers but not in uh, the right order so to speak.
Some, some help to you all and uh, I look forward to seeing you next year at Sligo and um, sorry we couldn't uh, do it this year uh, with this pandemic but uh, yeah so I find myself uh, in a practice room really going through these and hopefully when I do see you we'll be able to um, go through these together alrighty thank you and goodbye Hi everyone, welcome back to this next lesson. Now you know the story, we're on the gig uh, and it's time for a solo piano introduction. This is such an important way to signal how to get into a tune for all your other band members, so stay tuned for a few tips. We're on the gig. Somebody says, let's play Misty. Hey Scott, why don't you take a solo piano introduction? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, I can play Misty, yeah. So I start noodling. come to the end of my introduction. The band are looking at me, they have no idea where the time is. They don't know when to come in because I haven't established a meter. It's up to me as the pianist, as the solo introduction to make sure to introduce the sense of the, where the time is. Let's hear that again and this time I'm going to make it super clear. <laughs> knows where the start of the tune is. And it might seem like a very obvious thing, but it's really important to remember that. That it's clear to you where the start of the tune is, but you've got to remember the people that you're playing with don't have that telepathic understanding of exactly where you are. So make it super clear whenever you're coming up to the start of a tune. Hey, here's the time. I hope that was useful and you'll find it really useful to really let people know your intentions whenever you're starting a tune. You can never be too clear whenever it comes to expressing your intentions with music. Now, we've sorted the intro. We know the tune, we know how that goes. Let's talk about the ending. See you in a sec. We've all been there. You're coming up to the end of the tune, in this case, Misty. just land on E flat and be done with it. No way. There's way more interesting things we can do. Let's let me play you one and then we'll talk about it. This is 
is a much nicer ending. So we go. I've ended, I'm on my dominant chord of B flat. Rather than now resolving down to E flat, I'm going to go to A minor seven flat five. A flat minor six. Look at my top note repeated all the time. E flat over G. E major seven over F sharp. F minor seven. E major seven. Sharp eleven if you're brave. And down to E flat. And what I love about this ending in particular. Is the fact that the bass just starts dropping. Now I don't know if there's an exact name for this. I call it the flat five rundown because it starts on the flat fifth, which is A, and runs down chromatically all the way down, and it just gives the tune a really nice sense of, um, I guess the word would be. You weren't expecting it. We're all expecting the E flat, but no. And a nice little chord at the end. So quite a lot to cover in that video. We talked about how to get into the tune by keeping it super clear with your intentions in terms of setting up the time. But we also have a really, really nice outro that we can put on the end of the tune. This sounds great solo piano. If you're playing it with an ensemble, just let them know in advance, hey, I'm gonna do this, uh, this rundown. It sounds great whenever you're playing it um, with people that really understand and really know what's happening and know what's going to go on. So let people know in advance. Great. Get practicing. All 12 keys. Off you go. See you in the next one. Bye bye. Welcome back for day five, the final preparation before we learn the song tomorrow. And if any of you have guessed yet what the song is, it would be a miracle, but you might get it from today. Today, we're going to have a look at um, something, uh, an exercise that has evolved from some of the bigger intervals in this song. It's, it's a lovely tune. It's by Oscar Hammer, Hammerstein and Jerome Kern. And, it, um, and I'm hoping today will really help for when we learn it tomorrow. So um, nice and tall, as we always say, shoulders back and down, um, getting ready to sing this exercise. We're going to sing it to Leela. That's the first part of the exercise. So we're building up um, to a major sixth and we are making sure that all the uh, the vowel sounds are really nice and bright. Lila, Lila. We're really keeping them bright. Lila, Lila, Li. And then we're going back to where we started. And then we're dropping down a semitone. Back to where we started. Now, the idea is that the top note. that we try not to make the jump between the two too much of a big jump. We're trying to imagine that actually, you're actually singing. So that you're imagining that all the notes are really close to each other. Instead of, li, la, li, la, li, la, li, la, li, up and down, up and down. Really try and imagine they're nice and flat. Sing them with me. Li, la, li, la, li, la, li. top nice and bright. Here we go. All together with me. Here we go. And again.
and work our way way down. Shoulders back and down. With a smile helps. Nice and light on the bottom notes. them a few times before tomorrow you are going to be steps ahead with a big advantage for learning this song um and i look forward to seeing you then thanks for being with me all week and see you really soon see you tomorrow Hi there, this is Phil Robson with another um, micro jazz guitar lesson. Um, I thought I'd just think uh, today about some general stuff um, about, you know, playing solos and uh, just the techniques and stuff like that I use for playing melodies and guitar generally, really. Um, I'll just say super quickly, if you haven't found... Uh, any kind of warm-up yet, I'd really suggest you think about that. I use one called The Spider, which you can find easily online. There's variations of it too, but just something where you can find a way of focusing your hands with maybe a tiny stretch, but nothing, no crazy stretches, and go for slow rather than fast. The best warm-ups are slow. Anyway, um... But what I was thinking about is how important the downstroke is on guitar, particularly for playing jazz. Um, there's a lot of articulation and accents in jazz. And uh, I was lucky when I was a kid to have lessons with a guy called John Richards, who was a great teacher and player. And he made me really think about downstroke. So, so that's my kind of first point of reference, really, in terms of thinking about guitar, thinking about technique. Um, the nice thing is about downstrokes, you know, gravity does most of the work, so you can let the thing pretty much fall. And you can start to develop a really big sound just using downstrokes. And also, it doesn't have to be hard. Um, it's a great thing to be able to control volume um, with your hands alone without using a foot pedal or anything. If you can develop a sense of dynamics, which is, it's really nice to have that just in your hand. So, so you can still play a very legato kind of style. Um, I'll just play for a second, but I'll try and vary the volume and stuff. expression just using downstrokes and when you do switch to up and down I just what I do when I do that is I just even it out so rather than this angle I just pull it slightly back so the strings are more a, a right angle um, but if you've worked on your downstroke then you can you can push certain notes out so that they stand out That if you uh, you know if you want to play a style that has attack, can come from your left hand and from dampening, and I think dampening is super important. Like, just a real quick story. Years ago, I had a um, lesson with Pat, Mar great Pat Martino, and um, you know, as always, when you see a, a great player like him. Um, 
uh, you notice how relaxed they are, you know, like his shoulders are not tense, there's no tension like here, or this is not super hard. But what I noticed was how accurate his left hand is, and how much of this attack, which I thought might be coming from the right hand, was actually coming from this kind of dampening of the left hand. I'm over exaggerating, but there's almost a gap where you take the pressure off the string and you have to be pretty relaxed to do that. But it's great for playing up tempo things because you sound like a, you can sound like you're articulating every note with the right even if you're not. You know, I'm a mixture of things there, pushing some notes out with down strokes. Mixing the volumes as well. So anyway, it's just a few, few ideas, but things that I've thought about myself over the years and still working on. So uh, I hope you get something from that and wish you all the very best of luck with your playing. Thank you for listening. Let's look at other rhythms and cultures that have been absorbed into jazz. Probably uh, quite a straightforward one to start with is the, is the calypso. So the calypso um, is generally it's a one bar pattern across one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, bum, tip, bum, tip, bum, bum, tip, bum, tip, bum, ah, 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 ah. Ah, you might play it here. I mean, where you choose to play it is wherever it sounds good with the other instruments you're playing. You might choose to play it here. About two, three, four. Make the choice yourself. The choice is yours. But what becomes interesting is when we combine that rhythm with the tune. For instance, uh, that Solly Rollins tune. Ba da ba be yo po 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 be po po. So instead of just playing our rhythm. Playing that calypso rhythm, but also bearing in mind the tune as well. And remember, it's a dance. The whole thing's a dance. So it's got to feel good. Got to feel good. Got to feel good. Uh, but if you're playing with another percussionist, you must make sure, or I try to make sure that I'm not covering sounds that they've they're playing. And also, there's no point in, in me playing that rhythm. I might just play it. Or something that will settle so they can play. There's no point in both getting on the same line. If you listen to lots of records, you'll hear that happening. Just people finding their line. But it's really important as I've always stressed to remember the tune. If you know that tune, you can get away with not really knowing what rhythm it goes with, almost, because the rhythm is all in the tune. You know, if we're playing T for two, it's all there. Um, oh, no, cha-cha-cha. Uh, 
it's all there. It's, it's, the, it's limitless. It's up to your imagination. If you're singing that tune, you can play it any way because it will come out. Because these arms and these sounds you make here are your voice. Okay. It's getting late. Good luck with all that. Make of it what you will. Hi there, I'm Federico Laman and welcome to my channel. In today's practice along, my aim is to get you to play a simple solo. The exercise will be on the 251 harmonic structure and we will be using the notes of the major scale only. In this case, we will play C minor Dorian, F7 mixolydian and B flat major. This means that we will be using just the notes of B flat major scale, B flat, C, D, E flat, F, G, A. The video is divided into three main parts. The first part is a listen and repeat style solo. I play a phrase and you try to repeat it straight away using just your ear. The second part is a full solo composed by all the phrases that we just played combined together. The third part is my own improvised solo using the same exact elements of the major scale. Before starting to play with me, I suggest you to download a PDF from the link below. It contains the first two solos. You will also be able to download the backing tracks that you can use to create your own improvised solo. If you are enjoying this video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. And let me know in the comments below what topic you'd like me to cover in the next videos. And now, let's go. Thank you. 
So I'm just keeping my foot going to pulse one and 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 very important that you feel the and so the foot goes down one and two and three and four when your foot's up physically say and so we can have slowed one and two and three and four 
So if I just wanted to play the ands. <laughs> One and two and three and four and you can hear my foot in the background. So it's a really great way to keep your pulse going and also really not getting lost in uh, uh, standards, original tunes, whatever it may be, to really, uh, and I'm not counting on two and four, I'm counting on a one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So I'm on one and three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, for this one. So I like to really ground the one where I am. Great when you're reading uh, maybe chord charts too, because you can really know what chord you're on, you can, yeah, you can look ahead a bit at the next one that's coming up helps with that too but for your internal time it's amazing and to really then find your upbeat to be be aware of the upbeat one and two and three and one and so my foot's going down up one, one and two even take a tune one two three four <laughs> one and two and three and four and so you can really play even take a melody like that saint thomas and just play around it <laughs> grounds me where I am in a tune or just for your pulse as well even if you decide just to play a uh, free rounder whatever you're playing foot going really important um gives you a lot more confidence as well as a as a musician hi everyone and welcome back to lesson five in this short series of micro lessons on the power of 40 using metronome placements to improve our overall sense of time, uh, being able to move fluently, or hopefully becoming fluent and in moving into double time feel, half time feel, um, and, and giving us a really solid sense of time and confidence in our playing. Uh, okay, so we're, we're on the power of 40, but what we're gonna do now is we're gonna have a metronome on 40 beats per minute, but we're gonna blank out beat two and th uh, four. Effectively, the metronome will become 20 beats per minute. So here, here's our metronome on 40 beats per minute. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, Four, and we could play our slow blues again at 40 beats per minute with the metronome on beat two and four this time. Or we could play our 80 beats per minute with the metronome on beat four only. Or we could play uh, our 160 beat per B, uh, BPM with the metronome on beat four of every other bar, which is what I'm going to start with now. Four, one, two, uh, sorry, let me, let me, so we've got to really count the time here. 
four, one, two, three, 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 four. So it takes a little while before you really lock in. So there may be a little bit of movement, as we said before. Uh, that's quite natural. So now what we're going to try is the metronome on the same tempo, uh, but the metronome on uh, beat four of every other bar. So I want to blank out another one of these beats. So we're going to still be playing at 160 BPM, but this metronome is going to be clicking on beat four of every fourth bar. So let's try and feel where that is, yeah? Uh, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, one. complete uh, interpretation of the power of 40 and it's really helped my playing a lot um, and given me confidence in uh, uh, identifying my weaknesses first in, in time feel and then giving me a strategy to deal with it so it can be applied and you can be very creative with its application in, 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 in any way you wish for me I use it on tunes and scales so far uh, maybe you can we can use it in compositions, uh, but it's really for you to uh, tailor make it to, to suit your own um, practice schedule. But anyway, I hope that you can get uh, as much value out of the power of forty as I have within my own playing. Thank you. Okay, so this video is about playing uh, lead trumpet. Um, one thing that I love to practice is a beautiful ballad, a beautiful melody. I'll pick one. Uh, I love that tune, My Romance. Um, and how does that relate to playing lead trumpet? Well, I think when you're playing lead trumpet, you always want to sound as musical as possible, uh, and you always want to make it sound as easy as possible rather than kind of, you know, really strained or really pecky or really um, you know you want it to sound really beautiful and really musical um, or have certainly have the ability to make it sound like that 
Um, so one thing that I like to practice is a ballad. Um, but um, kind of related to one of the other videos when I talked about the musical calisthenics for brass concept, this is this concept, just taking a bit of a step further. Um, and uh, I believe Maynard Ferguson used to do this. So pick a ballad, play it through, have a little bit of a rest, and then move it up um, a minor third, or a fourth, or a third, or whatever. Move it into a different key a bit higher and play through the whole thing again. So. So that's in that key, and then have a little rest, then I'll move it up again. So it's kind of it's kind of an extreme long note exercise, um, but a musical long note exercise. So then eventually, you know, if you can, you'll be an octave up from where you started. So, for me, that's quite a nice way to build up a uh, lead trumpet kind of stamina, is do it in a really musical way, play a really beautiful ballad, take it through, uh, through some different keys, and uh, just enjoy playing some nice music in different, in different registers of the trumpet. So there you go. Hope that's been helpful.